start recording now? Okay. Um, so again, this is the PowerPoint for Moodle. Um, <clears throat> and let's see. I'm just looking for my uh, laser pointer here. Okay, well, you can see the little pen. Um, so we're gonna be uh, focused on uh, three elements of the analysis for today. Um, quality assessment, um, <coughs> using a program called FASTQC. And I tried to remember to put programs in italics, uh, at least I did it some of the time. Um, and uh, trimming of sequence reads with a program called Trimomatic, and then um, alignment of, or pseudo alignment of reads to a transcriptome reference with Callisto. Um, so these are all programs on the right, and then what they're doing is on the left. Okay. All right, so <clears throat> I wanted to um, start talking about uh, FASTQ files and the, because um, this is what our, this is what we have right now for our data. Um, and I can't remember if we've mentioned this before, um, but here's a review at any rate. Um, so it, each um, sequence is typically four lines um, where the first line uh, starts with the at symbol and has uh, some kind of label, uh, so the name of your read, <coughs> followed by the uh, sequence itself, the A, G, C's, and T's, an optional line, uh, which I've never really seen used, and then um, a fourth line, which is <laughs> equality score. Um, so these are uh, in kind of a cryptic format, these ASCII characters. Um, <clears throat> uh, but those can be converted into um, <clears throat> numbers that then can be converted into error probabilities. Um, so how does that work? Um, okay. Well, I just want to mention that the um, the line up here, the ID line, usually gives is a gives them information about the run and then the specific read, uh, the number of the read. And if it's paired data, there'll be a one or two at the end of it that tells you what its mate, where its mate is in the other in a companion file. <clears throat> okay, but the by far the um, most uh, quizzical part about this is the error probabilities, which have been reduced to a single ASCII character. Okay, so, um, so these things are um, quality scores in, in ASCII encoding. Um, so this right, let's focus on this colon right here uh, for the base T. Uh, that colon has a, a quality score of 25. So to, how do we get a 25? I'm just gonna flip to the next one real quick. Um, <clears throat> the next slide here shows um, all these ASCII characters um, um, and then the decimal value associated with these ASCII characters. And so let's see, where is colon 58? Um, colon has a, a ASCII decimal value of, of 58. <clears throat> okay. Um, and so the um, these sequencers use values between 33 and 73, which is a range of 40. Um, but how do you use that colon to get um, 25? Well, um, to get the quality score, you, you subtract 33 from the value that you look up, um, which was, again, 58. So 58 minus 33 gives you 25. And that's the quality score. And then, um, the error probability is 10 times negative the quality score over 10. So 10 to the negative 25 over 10, um, or negative 2.5 is gonna be the error probability. Um, See, so you, you guys are gonna probably want your calculators in today's uh, lecture here. So let's see, uh, does anyone have a calculator that can figure out 10 to the negative 2.5? And then just put it in the chat. See if I can see the chat from here. Yeah. All right, Anya got it. Anya wins. 
the little oh. <laughs> okay, yeah, um, 0 0.0032 <clears throat> um, is what I got when I put in uh, 10 y to the x negative 2.5. So that's uh, a pretty small error probability, but not minuscule when you consider um, the millions and millions of reads that um, that we're talking about. Okay. Um, okay, so it just is a way to save space to encode these in that particular way. Let's see. Any questions you guys are best off asking verbally because it's a little hard for me to uh, see the uh, see you if you're raising your hands or the chat uh, when I'm sharing my screen. Uh, I can only see three of you at a time. <coughs> okay. So, Um, what I want you to do next is calculate the quality score uh, from one other base that you see in the figure. So um, you see A, you see 9, you see um, the at symbol B, question mark, F, C. So just uh, go ahead and calculate um, using the ASCII table and the um, the equation um, of subtracting the 33, get the quality score, and then um, also the error probability. So <clears throat> in the chat, you can give me the character that you looked up, um, question mark, for example, the, dec the ASCII decimal value, the quality score, and then the error probability. I'm gonna just do the colon real quick, show you what I mean. Oh, hey, Ben. All right, so once you've got your quality, your character quality score and error probability, just put it in the chat to everybody. Some of you may have the same one. That's a good thing. I'd love to see if we get the same answer. If you have any questions, you can also put those in the chat. Did anyone do A, for example? Okay, here we go. <laughs> so Maria has uh, B, got looked up 66, subtracted 33. Wouldn't 66 minus 33 be 33, Maria?
Okay, we're seeing good agreement about at. Um, for, for those of you who have already given me your um, answer there, you can also convert error probability to quality score. Um, by taking a negative 10 times the log 10 of the error probability. So you can go ahead and try that. Um, if you already have your conversion done and see if that works. <laughs> Maybe I missed it, but how exactly are we copying the error probability? Um, you, I just wanted you to pick a letter from, can you see the FASTQ file? Um, can you see my cursor dancing around? Around on the screen. Uh, do you guys see the FASTQ, uh, did you see the FASTQ format slide? Yeah, I do. Okay. So the, the fourth line are the um, ASCII encoded quality scores. Yes, yeah, so I chose the uh, dollar sign, and I, it has a Q score of 33. So I subtracted it from 30, which is 3. Oh, wait, OK. So I'm looking for dollar sign here. I don't oh, sorry, it has 36, sorry. Where's dollar sign? So I was asking you to pick one that was here, but that's OK. okay. We, we could go ahead with dollar sign if it's within. OK, dollar sign's 36. So you subtract 33 and get 3. three. Um, That's a Q score, right? Um, yeah. And to get an error probability, you take negative 10 to raise to the negative 3 over 10. Uh, say that again, sorry. Uh, it's this little equation on the bottom here. Um, I'm trying to show it with my laser pointer 10 to the negative 3 over 10. So 10 to the negative 0.3. 10 to the negative 0.3. So did you get 0. 0.50? Um, yes, 0. 0.50. One, yeah. one. That, that would be a really low quality score um, with a high error rate. Okay. okay. Looks like... Uh, Looks like most everyone um, has their numbers up here. Were you getting it, Ben? Yeah, I was just following, around, following along with you and Eddie, and yeah, I think I got it now. OK. Um, <clears throat> good. So the understanding that um, these really cryptic uh, letters indicate for each nucleotide, um, the likelihood of an error um, is uh, really helpful to understanding how good your data is. Um, is there anyone else who uh, has any questions about those conversions? <laughs> like I said, I also put up here in the chat um, the conversion of an error probability to a quality score is negative 10 times the log base 10 of the error probability. I think this is actually kind of an easier um, one to do in your calculator. Um, and we'll see some examples of this in just a second, of those calculations. Some more examples. <laughs> um, and so what we just did was go from ASCII to decimal value, subtract 33, and then get a FRED quality score. For example, um, this, I guess the question mark was 63. 
Subtract 33, get 30. And then um, a quality score of 30 is an expected error rate of one in a thousand, um, 10 to the negative three. <coughs> All right, <coughs> sorry. Um, so here uh, is an example of, an, of a, um, an output from the program FASTQC. Um, and this checks the quality of the sequence re sequencing reads over your entire experiment all at once. Um, and it's a per base sequencing quality graph. So on the x-axis, you have your position within each read, um, starting from the first position on the left, to the uh, last position on the right, and then those quality values on the y-axis. And what's nice about the quality values is um, that a higher quality value, like a 40, <coughs> indicates a, um, a better read, as opposed to having to deal with error probabilities where there's an inverse. Um, these quality scores are also sometimes called FRED quality scores, um, P-H-R-E-D. Okay, a score of 40 indicates a one in 10,000 chance of error for that nucleotide, uh, 31 in 1,000 and 21 in 100. Um, in this graph, 28, scores of 28 and above are colored uh, green for high quality. The central um, orange section is median, uh, or uh, um, sorry, the central red line is the median. Uh, so these, these are box plots, box and whisker plots. And um, <clears throat> the way those work is the, the median is the red line where 50% of the data is higher quality, 50% lower. The um, interquartile range are the, the boxes. So um, below the, the bottom of the box is the bottom 25% of the data. So um, they contain the central 50% of the data. And then the whiskers indicate the um, 10, 10 percentile and 90th percentile quality scores for each position uh, within the read. <coughs> um, and so it's what you're looking at, this is a very good read where all of the whiskers even are in the green. Uh, and the blue is the mean. So you can kind of see a blue line um, <coughs> at the bottom of the box. Those are the blues, I mean, the, the means. Okay. Um, and sometimes what will happen is at the beginning and the end of the reads, there'll be um, a decline in quality because over time, reagents get old. Um, and so in this slide, um, <coughs> you can see an example of um, this decline in quality towards the end of the read and, and the whiskers are going into the red. Um, and again, if you have a question, just you're going to have to speak because I can only see a few of you at once. If you uh, um, I can see four of you, uh, if you have a question. Okay, um, so the program Trimomatic will help you deal with low quality reads. Um, <clears throat> one of the things it can do is take out individual uh, bases from individual reads that have a low score from either end. Uh, it'll just chop away at the ends individually um, if you, for bases that are below a certain value. Another thing it can do is um, a sliding window where it looks at a window of four bases, for example, um, starting at the end of the, the sequence, and we'll um, look for if the reads go below a certain average quality score, <coughs> then the, um, the, wind, the entire window and everything after it is thrown out. Um, so if it scans along in, in the window and it goes, um, you know, if at any point it goes below uh, an average of, let's say, uh, 15, a quality score 15, then <coughs> it would cut the the read from that point on. And then it can also, um, based on that trimming, there might be some really short reads and you can then um, throw out any read that isn't at least I base pairs. Okay, any questions on this stuff so far? It's a really nice uh, tool, these box plots, because you might have <coughs> you know, 200 million reads and uh, this gives you a, a quick snapshot of how good the uh, data is in just one graph. Um, and what you're seeing from the left to right here is a before and after quality filtering. Um, and so, <clears throat> um, what do you think? Did it have an effect, the quality filtering? And how can you tell? What kind of effects? Anybody on, uh, video, on audio? 
so it had an effect in that the overall um, quality scores probably higher since the lower lowest um, quality scores were or lowest quality uh, data was cut from off. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, on the right, you don't have any of those whiskers now below the uh, into the, in the red, which is below I think twenty something. Um, okay, so. The front end looks kind of the same, but the, the tailing end, which is always going to be more of a problem, is has been fixed, fixed up a little bit. Um, and this is important for um, the kind of aligner we're using, we're going to use is called Callisto, and it just throws out any reads that have errors uh, compared to the transcriptome. Uh, so if you had a lot of errors, it would just throw out those reads. So it's better to trim them um, than lose them. Okay. Um, other types of aligners can handle some some um, errors uh, and just aligns them, but but they're much much slower than Callisto. So um, we're going to be doing quality trimming of our data. All right. So this brings us to Callisto, um, <clears throat> which is a uh, super fast and highly accurate aligner. Um, or yeah. Um, it, but it doesn't produce uh, <clears throat> true alignments, which are nucleotide to nucleotide alignments. Um, it, it rather focuses on um, which transcripts a sequence read is compatible with, um, but doesn't actually do an exact alignment of each nucleotide in the transcript. Um, and so it saves time by, see, by seeing which um, transcripts a read could have come from rather than um, focusing on an exact alignment. <laughs> okay. Um, another way it speeds things up is that the raw FASTQ sequence reads are compared to the transcript sequences, not to the genome, a much larger genome sequence. Um, so you either need a transcriptome or an annotation file that will allow you to, as a preliminary step, <clears throat> pull out just the coding sequences from a genome. And I have uh, two uh, links up here at the top. One is a uh, where these figures were taken from, <clears throat> just kind of the description. Um, so if anything I say doesn't make sense, you can look at this author's take on things. Uh, and also there's a video from Iowa State that um, also was pretty good and, and was a little broader than, um, than the coverage that I'm doing as well. Okay, so, so the figures that you're about to see um, may not make sense to you the first time. I had to look at them maybe 10 times in order to understand this. But hopefully, um, it won't take you quite as many times uh, as that <clears throat> after I tried to give it my best shot at expl explaining it. Um, so we'll see. All right. Um, so in this picture here, um, in figure A, we have uh, transcripts. <clears throat> so there's uh, three transcripts here, um, uh, a pink, a blue, and a green. And um, they've been aligned and uh, you can see that uh, that the pink and blue the, on the left half of this figure um, overlap completely and then the green transcript uh, cuts out earlier. So this might be a place where it, there's an exon that's not used. Um, in this figure, which is from the paper, this gap isn't really explained. Um, so it might be just a yada, yada, yada. On the other end of the transcripts, the red transcript ends early, a pink one ends early compared to the other two. <coughs> yeah, it's a dot, dot, dot. So um, anyways, so our transcripts are up top and then um, they've been aligned in this way. And then down below in B, uh, you're seeing <coughs> um, a representation of what they call what are called camers. Uh, camers are, are short uh, sequence segments of the uh, transcripts of a fixed length, like uh, five. So if you have the entire sequence, if this is a like a hundred base pair sequence here, um, the first five base pairs would be a camer, um, a five mer of that sequence. Just the first five, just the first five, first five bases, uh, and then the next camer would be, <coughs> excuse me just shifted over by one base pair. Um, and so you can um, generate camers just shifting one base pair, one base pair, one base pair, base pair going from left to right throughout the entire um, transcriptome. Uh, what is being represented here are uh, three different uh, camers as these circles. 
um, and put when you put the um, circles together like this over the uh, in this this graph they call it um, you end up uh, giving a representation of a path through the transcriptome over all of your transcripts um, <coughs> and so uh, this thing is called a transcript transcriptome de Bruin graph which I put in the notes um, and it represents uh, different paths through the transcriptome um, and <clears throat> the uh, in these circled areas, these camers are compatible with different transcripts. So they they contain the uh, sequence or overlap with different transcripts. So um, this first camer overlaps with green, blue, and pink. The second one does as well. The third one does as well. Um, uh, but this fourth one here uh, does not. It only overlaps with blue and pink, for example. <clears throat> okay, so different camers uh, are compatible with different transcripts. Um, and the reason that the uh, program breaks the, <clears throat> the reference transcriptome and all the isoforms into camers is just for speed, purposes of speed. Um, okay, so here uh, you're given a read. I don't, you, uh, hopefully you guys can see my little laser pointer there. Um, up top you see a read in, in black, so we have um, the exon, and then <clears throat> I guess it looks like an intron here, uh, and then the exon continues. Um, okay, so the um, the camers in black in in uh, C here, the ones in black are detected uh, in the read. <coughs> so these are uh, parts of the sequence that were also part of the read. And um, let's see. Uh, in this version here, you, you're shown the compatibility, compatibilities of each camer in the read with each transcript. Uh, and this, in the paper, they give this uh, a fancy name of K-compatibility class. Anyways, um, it's just showing that this camer here is consistent with the green, pink, and blue colored transcripts, um, whereas these ones up here are only consistent with uh, pink and blue. <clears throat> um, Let's see. So if we look, uh, the first three camers are compatible with pink, blue, and green, um, but the cameras four and five are only compatible with pink and blue. Um, and then what, uh, finally, what <coughs> uh, Callisto will do was we'll look at the intersection of the compatibility, camera compatibilities across the read. Um, and then that will give you the set of transcripts that are compatible with the read. So um, if we look at these five camers, um, you have these first three are all gonna be blue, pink, green, uh, but these ones here are only blue and pink. So the intersection of, of those different types of, <coughs> of camer compatibility classes is just blue and red. So from this, the, uh, the program would infer that um, the read is compatible only with transcripts blue and, and pink, but not green. Um, <clears throat> let's see, the other thing that it does is if you have a series of camers with the same camer compatibility classes, it will skip over ones that are identical. And, um, and so um, the second and third camers here have the same camer compatibility classes that is the same, they're consistent with the same transcripts as each other, as the first one. Um, and so, this skipping um, is something else that saves space and time. And uh, it turns out that most reads can be represented by just the first and last camera compatibility class. Uh, something like 80 or 90% <laughs> of all reads can be reduced to, and their, and their pseudo alignment is just reduced to the, where they start and where they end, according to the reference. Um, okay. So that was a lot. Um, any questions uh, at this point, or did that, um, makes sense. <laughs> Let's see, I completely lost my view of you guys, so you could all be gone right now. Um, but I will get better at this over time. Okay, well, please use your volume then uh, if you have um, any questions. <clears throat> all right. <laughs>
Yes. So I have many questions, but I'm not really sure where to ask. Um, so is there a reason why, maybe a more complicated reason why it can be reduced or to like, or skipped over so much? Uh, because um, there isn't that much alternative splicing um, and there's only perfect uh, reads are, are used, ones that don't have any um, mismatching to the reference. And so most of the time you can basically tell where it maps just by the start and end of the read. Um, <clears throat> kind of like how you can read, um, I don't know if you ever tried to read a paragraph where the words in the letters inside of a word can be scrambled as long as the first and last letter of a word are the same. I don't know if you've ever seen that. I can I can show you text like that. Yeah, um, I, I get it. Exactly what you mean. <laughs> other questions? I mean, there's a there's a, there's a paper on this, but I didn't think it was very clear, uh, so I just didn't assign it. Um, <coughs> But the, the two links I gave you were actually quite good and is um, where I based my, uh, this discussion. Okay, so the output of a Callisto alignment then, or pseudo alignment, um, is a file that uh, lists each, um, let's see, lists each <coughs> gene isoform and the um, account in transcripts per million. Um, which is for every million um, RNA molecules that were sequenced, this many came from um, this particular mRNA. Um, so if you <clears throat> have different sequencing depths for every sample, which we do, um, ours range from three to eight million, um, you're basically figuring out, okay, per million, how many, this TPM is per million, how many um, counts do you have? And this is uh, an Excel viewable file, <laughs> but there are other ways to look at it too. Okay, Sleuth. Um, Sleuth is the program that will um, figure out the differential ex significant significance of differential expression. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I'm assigning the <laughs> Sleuth paper to you guys to read for Monday. And um, <clears throat> I'm gonna give you guys uh, a question, a few questions to answer as you're reading it. It's uh, highly technical and you're not gonna understand everything that's in there, but um, it's you know better than reading nothing. And, and I'll try to explain certain elements of it on Monday as well. Um, okay, but the output of Sleuth then is going to be a gene list with the log two fold differences um, in expression between uh, experimental conditions for each gene and a false discovery rate or <coughs> q-value. Um, so the a false discovery rate corrected p-value. And you might uh, wanna look again at this, the lecture that we gave, I, I posted on Moodle earlier in the semester um, talking about false discovery rate. Um, but again, these are gonna be uh, p-values that are corrected for the fact that you might be doing 10,000 or 40,000 tests and um, we'll just expect a high number of false positives unless you try to, to um, correct for those. And if you have a 5% false discovery rate, that means that if you have 100 um, <clears throat> you know, genes that are significant after correction, only five of them would be um, false positives. Okay, um, so <clears throat> a twofold uh, difference um, is a common threshold for differential expression, um, which would be a log base two of one. Um, so basically the way, remember how logs work, uh, two, log base two, um, yeah, it's, uh, okay. Log base two of two is one. So two raised to the one gives you two. Um, so if you put in your calculator, you know, 10, for example, and take log 10 of 10, it's going to give you one. So 10 to the one gives you uh, 10. So basically the, what you're solving for is the exponent that you have to raise the base to to get the value that you're solving for. So 2 to the 1 will give you 2. Anyways, the, um, it's kind of hard not to, to, to show this without drawing on a piece of paper for me or board. <coughs> so apologies about that. Um, but basically if you have uh, genes that are upregulated, uh, you'd 
you know, genes that are upregulated, upregulated, one of the ways of, of um, <coughs> filtering them is to look for log fold change of greater than one or less than one for, for downregulated um, genes. So a, value, a log base two change of one means it's, it's twofold higher in experimental than control. Okay. Um, this is an example of a sleuth output where you have log two fold change here. Um, and then log 10 of the Q value on the Y axis. <coughs> um, and so looking at log two fold change of positive two, um, why don't you guys just use the chat and, and someone can figure out um, how much more is the, um, is expression, how much higher is expression in the experimental than control if you have a log two fold change of two? <laughs> um, so this is the exponent that, you know, two is the exponent that you're raising uh, to two. Um, so two to the two would give you four. Um, so this, a log two fold change of two means that there's four fold higher expression. In the, uh, I'm just going to interpret the lack of response as I wasn't very clear. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so a value of one means that there's a, it's, it's two fold higher in experimental than control. A value of negative two means it's four fold uh, lower in experimental than control. And so basically, as you get further and further away from zero, which would be um, equal experimental in control, um, you have a, a more, you expect more genes to be significantly different between groups. Um, and then on the y axis here, this log 10 of the negative log 10 of the q value, <laughs> I don't know if yours is cut off. Um, yeah, negative, negative log 10 of the Q value. This is a similar transformation we did for those error probabilities to quality scores, um, where larger numbers indicate a lower Q value. So the red indicates significant, uh, different, significantly differentially expressed genes. Um, <clears throat> and this is called a volcano plot because it kind of looks like a, a volcano blowing up. Um, but up and to the sides should be uh, more red genes, which are more significantly, um, more significant genes. Significantly different. <clears throat> okay, uh, this is the last slide be before we'll uh, take a little break and then um, get started on the practical part of today. Um, so let's just say you have a big list of genes, like 100 genes <coughs> that um, are significantly different between your experimental groups. Um, Actually, figuring out what those um, do is a, a bit of a bear because um, you don't want to have to look up a hundred different um, gene functions necessarily. It's nice to be able to summarize those functions. And um, often, what's done is gene ontology enrichment analysis. Um, if you've ever seen um, any of the <clears throat> the students give a senior thesis at Juniata that are doing um, um, high throughput studies, they'll often talk about gene ontology analysis and, and enrichment. Um, so gene ontology terms um, <clears throat> are basically a way to describe properties of the genes, their function. Um, so if they, a certain biological process uh, might be associated with the gene, that's one gene ontology category. Also the molecular function and then where they are in the cell. Uh, so these are um, standardized functions, you know, the terms have all been standardized, so everyone is talking about the same thing in the same way. Uh, biological process is a really helpful one, for example, response to hormone stimu stimulus. Um, okay, and <clears throat> your particular gene set might be enriched for a particular gene ontology term um, if, uh, for example, there's a biological process observed at a higher percentage in your data set than in the transcriptome as a whole. That, um, that you've worked with. Uh, so the example here um, is if you have a transcriptome of 10,000 genes 
and 100 of them are of a particular function, uh, we can just, you know, response to hormone stimulus, for example, that might, that would give you your overall percentage of that type of gene, so 1%. Um, but in your gene list, you might have 40 out of 1,000 that are of that same process, uh, response to hormone stimulus. <clears throat> so you have 4% versus 1%. Um, so it's a higher fraction of this, um, of the total. Um, and so that would be an enriched gene ontology term. And so there are lots of different ways uh, to do this, but <clears throat> because the brook trout genome hasn't been um, well annotated, we're going to probably uh, use a mapping of our brook trout genes to the Danny Orario um, transcripts, uh, which is the um, zebrafish, in order to um, use gene ontology tools from other, um, that are online already. Okay, um, so <clears throat> we can go ahead and uh, take a break for a few minutes. Let me just um, go ahead and pause real quick again. Okay, did you guys have any questions so far on any of those uh, those pieces? Um, those are the the pieces that you're going to be writing about in your material methods in two weeks and and be practicing um, in order to analyze our data. <coughs> So you'll have, what I'm trying to say is you'll have lots of chances to get familiar with these, uh, these tools and techniques and ask questions as we go.